Looking at this spectrum can make anyone's head spin, but let's take it one step at a time and take a close look at what each of those peaks mean and how to interpret those peaks. Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to focus on HNMR splitting patterns, what they mean, where they come from, and most importantly, how to interpret and read them. First of all, why do we have splitting to begin with? If we look at something very simple, like let's say this ethane molecule over here, all hydrogens in this molecule are identical. They all have the same connectivity inside of the molecule and they all look like each other. They all have the same magnetic and chemical environment between themselves. Without going too deep into theory, the NMR instrument measures the amount of energy it takes to flip the nuclei spin. And since all the hydrogens are the same in this molecule, it neither takes more nor less energy to cause this flip in either of those hydrogens. So, in the eyes of the NMR, these hydrogens are indistinguishable. Using the terms of chemical topicity, we can say that they are all homotopic. And because each hydrogen is indistinguishable from one another, they all show as one single signal. But what happens if I take one of those hydrogens and replace it, say, with, I don't know, a chlorine atom? Now we have two different groups of hydrogens. One group is the hydrogens of the methyl group, I'm going to be calling them A, and another group is the methylene CH2 group that is next to chlorine, I'm going to call that B. And here is something very important. Since each group of hydrogens is unique now, hydrogens in each group have their own properties, including their own minuscule magnetic fields. So they are no longer going to be interacting with the NMR magnetic field in the same way. And on top of that, they have different energy that it takes to flip their spins. This will cause the differences in the chemical shifts for the hydrogens for each of those groups. But because hydrogens in each group have their own slightly different magnetic fields now around them, they're also going to start affecting their neighbors in a rather interesting way. So let's zoom on a single hydrogen from my molecule. Without any neighbors, it takes a certain discrete energy to flip the spin. The exact energy will determine the hydrogen's chemical shift, which we are going to represent in ppms. But the chemical shift is irrelevant for us at the moment, so I'm not going to focus on that right now at all. We can represent the spin as an arrow. This is a simple quantum mechanical trick that we can use for bookkeeping purposes. It doesn't have any specific meaning. We do have the same symbolic representation when we are talking about, let's say, electrons and their spins, so you probably remember we show electrons as little arrows pointing either up or down. Same kind of difference here. So while I can represent my spin with the up arrow or down arrow, I'm always going to be representing the nucleus of interest with the up arrow. So if I go back to my hydrogen of interest here, I'll say that its spin is the up arrow and its magnetic field is aligned with the external magnetic field of the instrument. But what happens if now I have a neighbor with its own magnetic field? That is where things become more interesting. You see, since the neighbor has its own weak magnetic field, it can either amplify the external magnetic field or it can diminish it by a very small amount. But no matter how small that amount is, it is large enough to affect our hydrogen of interest. And now, depending on what the neighbor is doing, it takes either a little more energy to flip the spin or a little less energy to flip that spin. And boom, we have splitting. And we'll call this signal a doublet. On paper, we can represent that as two possible spin states one in which both our spins are aligned in one direction and another one in which our spins are misaligned or aligned in the opposite directions, if you like. Okay, so one neighbor splits our signal in two. Got it. Easy so far. But what if we have two neighbors? What are we gonna do then? Well, let's examine the possible states that we can get in this case. We can have a state in which all of our spins are aligned or we can have a state in which one of the spins is aligned in the opposite direction, or we can have a state in which 
the both spins of our neighbors are aligned in the opposite direction from our original atom. So now we have three possible energy values that it would take to flip our spin. So we'll have a splitting that shows three peaks and that is something that we are going to call a triplet. And another interesting observation that we are going to see in those types of patterns is that the middle peaks are always going to be much higher than the outer peaks. And the more of those you have, the more of a pyramid-shaped signal you are going to get. So, how are we going to know the number of peaks that we should expect for each signal? Well, certainly we are not going to be sitting here and looking for all possible spin states for every single hydrogen. I mean, you'll either fall asleep or get straight to the loony bin. And despite what you might be thinking about organic chemists, that's not our intention in the slightest. Luckily for us, we can easily calculate the number of peaks in the signal using n plus 1 formula, where n is the number of your neighbors. And of course, by neighbors, I mean the neighboring hydrogens on the adjacent carbon. So coming back to my molecule over here that I started with, I have two groups of hydrogens here. As I've mentioned before, I'm going to be calling them group A and group B. We're always going to treat a group as a whole entity. And that's because each group gives the combined signal. So here I'll have a group A that gives one signal and I have a group B that gives another signal in our NMR. Here group A sees the two neighbors that is hydrogens B. Using the n plus 1 formula that gives me three peaks in the signal or a triplet in other words. Group B has three neighbors that are the hydrogens A. So using our n plus 1 rule again we are going to get four peaks in this signal or a quartet in other words. In addition to the n plus 1 rule that allows us to predict the number of peaks in each signal, we can also easily predict the intensity of those signals or their shape. For as long as your signals don't overlap, the signal's intensity will correspond to the numbers in the Pascal's triangle. You might recall this triangle from your algebra class if you have already covered the binomial distributions. So if I have no neighbors, I'm going to be expecting a singlet and of course the intensity of a singlet singlet is going to be, well, just one peak, so there is nothing to compare. If I have one neighbor, that's going to be a doublet, and in case of the doublet, I'm going to have two peaks with the same intensity. In the case of the triplet, we are going to have the middle peak being twice as strong as the outer peaks, and so on for all of my signals, all the way to something like non-ad, for instance, where the inner peak is going to be 70 times stronger than the outer peak. In most cases, the uh, intensity difference is going to be so drastic that you're probably not even going to be able to see the outer peak. Also, one other thing that I want to point out here is that we typically abbreviate the first four, the singlet, doublet, uh, triplet, and quartet by the first letter, and everything past that we typically call just a multiplet. But if you ever want to call them by their proper names, you certainly can do that too. All right, so now when we have a better idea about the splitting and how it works, Let's look at a few examples. My first example here, I have the HNMR spectrum of methyl butanoate. I'm going to label all of my groups as A, B, C, and D. And of course here I only care about carbons that have hydrogens. So although I have an oxygen and a carbonyl over here, I am not going to be labeling them in any way or form because, well, they don't have any hydrogens, so they are invisible in this type of spectroscopy. Here we see that the group A has no neighboring hydrogens on the adjacent atom. Thus, it's going to be a singlet. So my group A over here, the neighboring atom is oxygen. Oxygen doesn't have any hydrogens, therefore zero neighbors. Doing the similar analysis for our group B, we can see that B has two neighbors, so that is going to be a triplet. Now, when it comes to my group C, that one is a little bit more complicated. We have two neighboring hydrogens on the left, also over here on the B, and we have three neighboring hydrogens over here on the D. So the total number of neighbors that we have is five, and we are going to count all of those as our neighbors, which means that our signal is going to be a sextet over here. So if we very carefully count all of our peaks, we are going to have one, two, three, four, five, six peaks there. And as I've mentioned before, typically whenever it comes to anything above four 
peaks, we're just going to be calling it a multiplet, but for the sake of clarity, here in this tutorial, I'm going to be calling everything by their proper names. And finally, D here is a triplet, as it only sees two neighbors that are over here on the group C. And I want to emphasize one more time that whenever you are looking for your neighbors, you should always be looking at the neighbors on the adjacent carbon. So if, for instance, I have a carbon and that carbon has a hydrogen on it, the only neighbors that I am going to be looking at are going to be on my adjacent carbons. So the neighbors is going to be this hydrogen over here. Sometimes instructors refer to that as a rule of three bonds, because if I were to count my bonds, let's say this one is my hydrogen of interest, my neighbor is one, two, three bonds away. So this hydrogen is going to be my neighbor, while let's say this guy is not going to be counted as our neighbor because it is too far. And if we were to count our bonds, we'll have a bond number one, bond number two, bond number three, and that would be already four bonds away, so that's a little bit too far. There are, of course, some cases where the hydrogens can interact with each other through space, even when they are more than three bonds away. However, we're not going to see examples like that in the sophomore organic chemistry course, so for our purposes, we're typically going to limit ourselves to just three bonds. Another important aspect of the NMR spectroscopy is symmetry. You might have a molecule which has a plane of symmetry going Going, let's say through the middle of it, or maybe just a portion of our molecule is symmetrical. Well, in this case, the identical groups on the opposite sides of the plane of symmetry will show up as a single signal. So, for instance, let's look at the HNMR spectrum coming from this heptane for own. This molecule has the internal plane of symmetry, and because of that, our groups on the right are going to be identical to the corresponding groups on the left. So, I'm going to be like in the previous case, calling my groups A, B, and C, and overall, that means that our molecule is going to be giving us three signals here. And more importantly, when we are analyzing the splitting pattern for it, we'll have to consider the symmetry so we do not overestimate the number of neighbors that we have. So here, group A has group B as a neighbor. Since each group B has two hydrogens, group A is going to be a triplet. An important distinction here to keep in mind that I have group A on the right and I have group A on the left, and each of those groups A has group B as a neighbor, so overall group A only has two neighbors, each group A has only two neighbors, that's why we're not going to be overestimating that as four neighbors. Likewise, each group B sees A and C as neighbors, and we have three hydrogens on A and two hydrogens on C, giving us five neighbors combined for each of our groups B. Thus, our group B is going to be, like in the previous case, a sextet, so if I count all of my peaks here, I have one, two, three, four, five, six peaks in that signal. And finally, when it comes to my group C, while each C only sees B as a neighbor, so each C has two hydrogens as a neighbor, which means that it's going to be a triplet, and that is precisely what we see there. And before we move to the next example, I want to point out a common mistake that a lot of students unfortunately make. The n plus 1 rule works for predicting the number of peaks for each signal when we're looking at our molecular structure and trying to predict the spectrum's shape. However, most of the time, what you are going to be doing is literally the opposite. You'll have a spectrum in front of you, like what we have on the screen right now, and you'll need to decipher what exactly that spectrum means. And there is something important that you need to keep in mind here. If you're looking at the spectrum, you're going to be using your n plus 1 rule in reverse, which means that if I have, let's say, a triplet over here, that means that I have two neighbors. Or if I have a sextet, that means that I have five neighbors. Or if, let's say, I had something like, I don't know, a doublet. Well, doublet means that I have only one neighbor, and likewise, a singlet would mean that we have 
zero neighbors. So remember, the n plus 1 rule is the n number of neighbors giving you the number of peaks, which means that when you are seeing the peaks, you count your number of peaks and you subtract 1 to get the number of neighbors. All right, let's move on to the next example. Here, I have a spectrum of isopropanol, which is a simple three-carbon alcohol. You probably have a bottle of it in your home medical aid kit, uh, since isopropanol is commonly used as a rubbing alcohol for disinfection purposes. If we closely analyze the spectrum, however, we'll see a couple of rather interesting inconsistencies here. First, if we look at the signal coming from the hydrogen of the OH group, we'll see that it's a singlet, but we do have a hydrogen on the adjacent carbon. And remember, since we are talking about H and MR, we're looking at the hydrogens regardless to which atom they are attached. So don't make a mistake assuming that if your hydrogen is not sitting on the carbon, it's going to be irrelevant. Everything matters. But I digress. Looking back at my molecule here, I see a problem. We have just spent a fair amount of time talking about how neighboring hydrogen split. And here, all of a sudden, we are not seeing any splitting. Well, how come? Well, without going too deep into the details here, the hydrogen bonding that we have in alcohols is to blame. Any hydrogen that can freely participate in hydrogen bonding will neither show any splitting pattern itself, nor will it split neighboring hydrogens. We typically see this phenomenon for alcohols and amines and potentially other acidic hydrogens. So here, the OH gives you a singlet and the hydrogen that is attached to that carbon uh, gives you a septet aka seven peaks, as if it absolutely didn't see the OH as if it only has six neighbors. Also notice that although we have two groups B over here, they both are neighbors to group A, or the hydrogen A if you like, which means that we have to count all those hydrogens in our splitting. Symmetry can be a little bit tricky, so always stay vigilant, otherwise you may miscount your atoms or interpret your spectrum incorrectly. So in this case, all of my groups B, this one and this one, they both have hydrogen A as a neighbor, thus we have a doublet over here. But in the case of A, A has neighbors as one group B and the second group B, therefore we have a septet here. So finally, now I want to circle back to the spectrum that I showed you at the very beginning of this video. It is a large and complex spectrum and it's a fairly large molecule as well. However, now you can diligently go through the groups and see how many neighbors you have for each and why each group gives you the signals that you're seeing here. Pause this video and copy the molecule down if you need to and explain back to yourself how each of those groups match what you have in the spectrum on the screen. So this example and all the other examples that we have seen today, they show you what we call a first order splitting. And this is the most common splitting pattern that you are going to see in your course. This is of course not all of it. We can also have complex splitting, which is a whole different game. So I'll cover that topic in a different video. But for now, I want to encourage you to do as much practice as possible. Start with the practice questions in your textbook. Once you work through those, come and check my website organicchemistrytutor.com or join my Discord server with the link in the description uh, for more practice questions. And I have plenty of spectroscopy questions on my Discord server as well. And as always, thank you for watching. If you've learned something new today, boop that like button and leave me a comment below. Subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates, watch this video next, and I will see you tomorrow.